All right, welcome everybody. And today we are going to be talking about U.S. constitutional principles. I'm going to provide a very basic overview of the principles that are embedded within the American Constitution. Now, what is the U.S. Constitution? The U.S. Constitution is, of course, a document that lays out the rules and procedures for the American government. Okay, so it is the, uh, the, the recipe or the instruction manual for the way that the government is supposed to operate. Okay, and, and it is written and it was designed uh, by those who wrote and designed it to operate according to certain principles. Okay, certain key ideas uh, and uh, factors that are found throughout the Constitution, the document of the Constitution. And all I want to do today is just shine a little bit of a light through a very simple visual to help us start to wrap our head around these principles. Because you cannot appreciate the country of America or the, or the Constitution of America without understanding these principles. Uh, because these principles uh, are, um, they're, they're not the only options. They're not the only principles. Uh, these seven principles I'm going to talk about today were carefully selected from a, a, a wide array of potential guiding principles that the founders could have used, but they chose not to use them, and they chose to use these. Now, why did they decide to use these? That's really a topic for another video, uh, but the founders of America, in selecting these principles, they did not come up with these principles. Uh, these principles pre-existed the Constitution, and the founders were inspired uh, to select these principles uh, from a lot of sources of influence, uh, some secular uh, influences. We think about uh, the governments of the past, like ancient Greece and Rome, which shared some similarities with the, U the way the U.S. government is designed. We think about the principles of the European Enlightenment and the political philosophy that was uh, going on in Europe in the time right before America was founded. We think about the government that already existed in England and the long history in England of natural rights and English common law principles uh, that they borrowed from in setting up this government. Uh, we also think about some uh, religious influences as well. The Bible was a significant influence on the founders um, in coming up with these principles. And so uh, today we're going to see, uh, we're going to try to wrap our head around what these principles are. And to do so, we're going to use a visual. And the very first principle that we are going to talk about is limited government. Okay, so limited government. Well, the best way to visualize limited government, uh, we have to think about limited in what? What is limited? Uh, what's limited, as far as the government is concerned, is their power. Their authority over the people is a limited power and authority. It's not unlimited, okay? And you might say, well, of course it's not unlimited. Well, everything is on a spectrum, okay, from limited to unlimited, okay? A totally limited government would have absolutely no power. It'd be anarchy. A totally unlimited power government would be total... Uh, tyranny, okay? It'd be totalitarianism. That's where we get that word. And so the question is, it's going to be limited, okay? We're not going to give the government all the power. Now we have to think about another big influence of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the forerunning document to the Constitution, which says that, uh, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So they're given uh, by God certain inalienable rights. That means that the power begins with the people. And they base that on the Bible and on the natural law that they believe stated that the people uh, possessed the power originally, that it was not originally uh, uh, inherent in a government, but was inherent in the people, and the people then chose the government. Okay, And so the people started with the power. So I want us to imagine that the people okay, have uh, power, and power is tough to talk about because it's abstract. You can't see uh, a power. You can see power being wielded or executed, but you can't see the power itself. So I want to put I want to put some power in the hands of the people, okay? And I want to give them I want to give them each two big handfuls of power, okay? 
and the power is going to be represented by these blue circles. Okay? And I'll just leave them empty for now. And so you see the people have the power. They are endowed by their creator with certain things. And what they did is they decided, okay, to give some of it. They chose of their own volition, of their own free will, to give some of the power to the government. Okay? So they did. That's what they did. And the first place they did that was with their state governments. Because we have to remember that the state governments and the state constitutions in America pre-existed the United States of America. The United States was simply the state governments making a decision to unify into one government. So the very first thing that happened is, but even the state governments were limited governments, okay? They were limited governments. And so what the people did is they decided we're going to give up some of our power to the state government, okay? So these were people in Massachusetts, and they said, here, we're going to write a constitution for Massachusetts, we're going to write a constitution for Virginia. We're going to write a constitution for New York. And we're going to, in that constitution, we're going to declare that we have given up some of our power to the government. But I want you to notice something very important, okay? I want you to notice something very important. Have the people given up all of the power to the government? No. They've only given up a limited amount of the power to the government. I, you know, I, it, it, according to this visual, it, it's half the power. Okay, let's say they gave up half. Exactly how much? We could, we could talk, we could debate that. But the point is, they gave up some of it, not all of it. Notice that in their right hands down here, they've still got some of the power. They never gave it up, and that's very important to understand limited government. Okay, and so they gave up some of the power to the state governments through the Constitution. And through the Constitution, which was agreed to by the people, the state government received the power. Right? So look, they've got it. But it, it's very important, we're going to talk about this in a second, that it went through the Constitution. So here we see the state governments now sitting with a big ball of power. Now, did the, did the, do the states have all the power over the people? No, they've got some of it, okay? Some power is had by these limited governments, okay? Notice, the people still have power in their right hand. Now, what happened with the U.S. Constitution, because that is what we're really talking about, is the Constitution of the National Government. What happened with that is all the states got together and they decided, okay, the state governments actually, not the people, okay, the state governments decided that they were going to unify into a bigger government, okay? And so they, by the authority that they had in their constitutions, the limited power that they had, they agreed to give up, just like the people agreed to give up some of their power to the state governments, they agreed, the states agreed to give up some of that power to the United States. Now, what power did they have to give to the United States? They had limited power to give, okay? They didn't have this to even give. It wasn't theirs to give. It was retained by the people originally. But they had some to give. Did they give up all that they had? No. Let's call it, just to keep it simple, like we called it at the beginning, let's say they gave up half. They took half of the power that they had, let's say, and they gave it, they funneled it up through a federal constitution, and now they created a federal government that had some power. Right? It had some power. Now, what power did it have? It had half, let's call it half of the people's original power, half of the state government's power, okay? So how much power compared with the original? 25% if we're just following the, the example, the fractional example that we were using, okay? The main point is, they don't have all the power. They have a very limited amount of power at that federal government level, okay? Uh, because the only thing that was given, the only thing that the states had to give, and they didn't even give all that they had to the federal government. But the federal government got some power. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to, for, for the sake of the visual, I'm going to make it big, okay? But it's not to scale, okay? It's not to scale. It'd really be proportional down to here. 
Uh, so that's limited government, okay? Limited government is simply the idea that whether we're talking about the state government or the federal government of the United States, they don't, there are certain things that they never had, okay? There are certain powers that they never had. And we think about these maybe most uh, at top of our mind is the Bill of Rights, okay? A list of things. That, what the Bill of Rights is is a list of things that's still in our right hand. That's all it is. It's a list of things that we never gave away. Okay, it's not lists of things. A lot of people think the Bill of Rights is lists of things the government cannot, uh, cannot, um, uh, cannot do, but but they have the power and they're restrained from doing it. Okay, no, it's 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 things that the people kept. Okay, it's things that the people kept, and so we could talk about that forever. But the point is uh, that is limited government. Now, popular sovereignty. Okay is another um, principle of the U.S. Constitution. Popular sovereignty means, and this is interesting, that even though the governments have power, <laughs> they're still under the authority of the people. So get this, even though the power that they have is limited in the first place, you might think, well, the government, they only have a little power, so they get to use it, right, however they want. They really get to go to town with that 25% of the power that they got. No, actually not. Actually, still, even that little power that the people have given, okay, to the governments, the government still is under their authority. They're under the sovereignty of the people. How are they, doesn't it look to you in this visual like the governments are over the people? Okay, well, it, it would be true that the governments were over the people, except for above every government, what have I ever written here? A constitution, okay? And who wrote the constitution? Well, we understand the famous first three words of the constitution is we the people, Okay, so the government not only does it have a limited authority, but even the authority that it does have only comes from the people. Okay, so really even that power is only, okay, the specific power. It's not that they have limited power to do whatever they want. They have limited power to do only the specific limited things that were listed in the constitutions. Okay, that's popular sovereignty. Another way that we have popular sovereignty now, these principles, they're everywhere in, these, in the Constitution, in the state constitutions and the federal constitution. But another way that we have popular sovereignty is that we chose that these governments, uh, that the power would be wielded in these governments by people. Okay? The power in these governments would be wielded by people. So there'd be people up here. Okay? There'd be people, and they would be in power. Okay? So there'd be... People at the state level, you know, the state's only got half the power they originally had, but there's still people in there operating the levers of power in the state governments and the national government, and those people are elected. So it's kind of like double popular sovereignty, okay? Because these people, not only are they only allowed to do what the Constitution says, okay, so they're in this bubble that is only the bubble that was created by the Constitution, but they're also simply elected by the people, okay? So we also have popular sovereignty in that we elect, okay, the people who are even in the government. So it's kind of like we get it on both ends, the popular sovereignty, okay? They got, they got the people coming down on them from above and the people coming up against them from below that they can vote them out, okay, if we don't like what they're doing. Okay, on the, on the front end, we try to get them to swear an oath to the Constitution. And so technically, they're really only allowed to do the things that we allow them to do anyway, and we have popular sovereignty that way. But in another way we have it is that if they don't do it, or even if they do do it and we just don't like them, okay, or we just prefer somebody else, we have sovereignty over them and the fact that we can get rid of them, okay, the fact that we can vote them out, okay, and we have sovereignty over the states. Now, originally the states had a little bit more sovereignty over the elected officials in the federal government. Now we kind of have a direct, we kind of, we kind of go around the states ever since the early 1900s. We go more around the states and we have direct sovereignty over the federal government even. And that's a topic for another day. But uh, that's popular sovereignty. And what, what I've just described is also a principle called republicanism, okay? Which is that we designed these governments, whether at the state level or the federal level, and we designed them to have power. And we, and, but we we could have had we could have ran 
the, the machine. We could have pulled the levers of power in different ways. What we chose to do, what the founders chose to do is they chose to elect representatives to pull the levers of power for them, okay? And that's called republicanism. That's all that is, that R-E-P stands for rep, it's the same uh, root as representative, okay? It means that we're gonna have stand-ins, okay, for us, and they're gonna make the decisions. Why did we do that? Well, this, I, I, this could be a uh, too, I'll try to be quick on this tangent, but this is very important because you hear on the, on the news, uh, and uh, at school, uh, for the most part, that we have a demo, that we're a democracy. But that's not true. We're a republic. Okay, in a democracy, we would pull the levers of power ourselves. Okay, but obviously we don't do that. We don't vote on the laws of the country. That would be a democracy. Okay, but what we do is we vote for people, and then those representative people. Okay, vote on the laws. Why do we do it that way? Wouldn't, isn't democracy the best thing ever? That's what you hear in the media. But the truth is, there were, the founders had very good reasons for why they wanted to be a republic instead of a democracy. Um, we don't have time to go into all of them, but a democracy, they considered a democracy to be much more unstable uh, because the will of the people uh, shifted rapidly. What they saw in history is that in pu the purer and purer the democracy got, such as in ancient Greece, the uh, people's will was fickle, and the people would choose different things on different days, and things got very chaotic and eventually collapsed uh, because a sort of mob mentality takes over the minds of the people. And uh, so they very much did not want to be a democracy. Okay, They would be watching the news, and they would say, no, 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 a democracy uh, is not exactly what we want to do. That's why we made a republic, not a democracy. And now, while we do have representatives in the government, Remember, we have sovereignty over them, and they have a limited authority anyway, okay? So these are not, these are more like our, and I, I didn't mean to do this, but you see what I've almost created is these little puppet strings here, okay? These people are meant to be more like our puppets in the government than they are meant to actually exercise any authority over us that we did not freely choose to give them. And so uh, the fourth thing here is federalism, and that's simply the idea that we have multiple governments over us at the same time, okay, at multiple different levels. We have a federal government and we have a state government, and they share power. They share power. This is another thing that's misunderstood. Uh, many people today are under the impression that the federal government uh, can always overrule the state government, that the state government can do nothing uh, contrary to the wishes or the will or the laws of the federal government. Well, this is not true uh, at all. Uh, because remember, and if we just think back to the drawing, did the state governments even give the federal government all their power? No. They only gave them half the power anyway. Okay? So the power that they didn't give to the federal government, they just kept. Okay? And they're different powers. When I say half the power... I mean, you know, we don't have time to go into it right now, but I mean half the things that you can do to wield power, okay? They only gave them half the things, let's say. It really was less than half. It really was like 10%. And so uh, the idea is that the, that the states, in the ball of power that they kept, okay, let's darken out the part that they gave away to the federal government. They gave away this half, okay? But in the part that they kept, that they're still operating, they can contradict the federal government all they want because it's not the federal government's power anyway, okay? So there is almost no uh, possibility of a contradiction at all because only one group even has the power. When it says in the Constitution, and we're not going to get into specific wording of the Constitution today very much, but in the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution, it does say that the federal government, uh, no, no laws in the states can contradict the federal government, but that's, all, that's referring only to the powers that were delegated to the federal government, okay? That's only to the powers that were delegated to the federal government. So that's another lesson on federalism. But the point is we have multiple governments in authority over us at the same time, each with distinct powers that have been allocated to it. Very important. Because um, otherwise, what's the point of the state governments in the first place? Uh, so why keep them? Uh, the fifth is called the rule of law. Now, this is interesting. I'm going to have to go to a slightly new drawing here for the rule of law. 
So for principle number five, which is the rule of law, we've already addressed this to some degree when we've said that ultimately these people in positions of power that are pulling the levers of power in the government, they are not allowed to do whatever they want. We've already established this. I mean, it's almost, uh, it's almost funny the amount that they're not allowed to do whatever they want. Remember, they only have a limited authority. They are under the rule of the people via elections and via the Constitution, which we're about to talk about. And uh, in the elections is the Republican aspect. And they are part of a power-sharing agreement with another government, okay? So uh, through all these principles, what we've seen is a diminishment of the, of the independent power and autonomy that the people in the government have. Now, the rule of law is really the main way of expressing the idea that these people in the government, our rulers, cannot do whatever they want. Because we have the rule of law, and that's just another way of looking at the fact that what is ultimately in charge in our states or at the federal level is the Constitution. It's the document, okay? What's going to be in charge is the law, not, and whether it's the Constitution or whether it's one of the many other laws in the nation or the state, which remember, they all have to conform to the state constitution or the federal constitution. And so really, the constitution is in charge, not, the, not the, the leader. Now, it just so happens that our constitution was written by we the people. So you see, these principles, they're all connected. We're starting to see that they all really sort of, if you're starting to see some overlap in this, but wait, wasn't that popular sovereignty? Well, it just so happens that our constitution does show popular sovereignty because it is written by we the people. That's not always the case. Okay, the government could write a constitution and say we have to abide by the the, the rule of law. Okay, uh, that doesn't often happen genuinely, but usually the people have to force uh, them in some way to follow the law, and that's what we have tried to create. And so the idea of the rule of law is that the the leaders have authority only in so far as they are following the law. The other, other than the rule of law, what we would have is the rule of man. It's the only other option. We either have the rule of law or we have the rule of man. So what we have is a situation where our leaders today are supposed to be waking up in their, in their beds and they're supposed to be going, uh, my job today is to execute whatever I'm allowed to execute according to the Constitution. They're not waking up, they're not supposed to be waking up going, I wonder what is a good idea for me to do today. I wonder what is a smart idea that I've read recently that I should try to do in the government. I wonder what, uh, I wonder what uh, would be good in my view. That's not what they're supposed to be doing. They're more supposed to be button pushers and lever pullers, okay, of things that have been delegated to them by the law, okay? And so an, another illustration of this concept of the rule of law is this that I like to use. Uh, you have two scenarios when a leader is in charge. Uh, a leader gives an order. So let's say that the government, and here we'll draw another of my uh, little government buildings. And here's the government, and they're going to give an order. Well, that order, okay, is inevitably going to fall into one of two categories. It's either going to be constitutional, according to the law. It's going to be a lawful order or it's not going to be constitutional, right? Now, in the case where it is constitutional, we have to understand that the government does have the authority over us in those cases, right? So in that world, okay, where they've given a constitutional order, the government is on top. Okay, but why are they on top? We're showing you the same thing we've already shown, which is they're on top because they're not really on top of us, okay? We're really on top of them because we've given them the rule book, okay? The rule book is over them and the rule book is written by us. So if they are following the rule book, they are. They do have authority over of, of us. So they, the states, for example, have the police power. So if they say, uh, if you uh, commit murder, you get the death penalty, okay? That they can rightfully do that, 
Okay, they have total authority to make the police power for the state. If the state of New York wants to have the death penalty and you commit murder and it's been written down in the state constitution that, that, uh, or it's been decided in the legislature and it's not been found to be unconstitutional, that uh, you uh, must suffer the death penalty for that, then that's justified. That's justified. But if it's not constitutional, okay, then the people in the government, okay, really have no real authority to enforce the order. So what you have is a situation at that point where you have a government with no authority because the authority comes from the Constitution anyway. So you have a government official issuing an order, but really they're not doing it as a lawful government. They're doing it as some person who is in the office of the government. Okay, And we can understand this when we talk about interactions with police sometimes. So the police can do things that are unconstitutional. Do they have the right to, to do things that are uh, outside the scope of what they're allowed to do? No. Okay, And in that case, although they still have a police uniform on, uh, although the, the president might still have the president's clothes on, if it's unlawful, they're really just some person in police clothes or some person in president's clothes. But they're your peer at that point. They're your peer uh, at that point. They're not over you because they have not followed the right protocol. Okay, they have not followed the right protocol. Uh, so does that mean that they won't try to do that? Of course not. Uh, that's human nature uh, to try to exercise unrightful authority uh, for the most part. And so uh, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And I'm not advising uh, necessarily in this talk what you're supposed to do in that case. But this is how it's supposed to go. This is how you're supposed to think about it, because we have the rule of law, not the rule of man, okay? If that person is trying to do something that's not in the Constitution, they're trying to give you an order, they're trying to say, we don't have the rule of law, we have the rule of man, me, okay? And that's the only other option. We're either going to follow the law, or we're going to have the law of the jungle, basically, okay? And that's the rule of law. Now, number six is the separation of powers. So now let's go back. Let's go back over here and let's remember the power. Let's use the federal government for an example. Let's remember that the federal government received a limited, the states received a limited amount of power from the people. The states gave a limited amount of power to the government, to the federal government. And then what the founders decided to do is, you know what, even though they don't have uh, that much power, we're still uh, a skeptical of that, that they will use the limited power that they have properly. So here's what we're going to do. Because even though we didn't give them, and remember, I do this a little bit bigger than it really, it's not really to scale. Uh, we really retain a lot more power than, than we give. But for purposes of this uh, drawing, there's a big old rock here of power in the federal government. Now, if they drop, that the founders were worried that if they drop that big ball of power on your head, that's going to hurt. Okay, if they were to really uh, get together and say, let's take our power that we do have, even though it's not all the power in the world, and we're going to try to just slam it down on the head of this guy. Okay, they were worried about that because they were worried that, uh, that they would do that. Okay, and so here's what they did. They said, look, they weren't satisfied with the fact that we didn't give them very much power anyway. They weren't satisfied. They said, even the power we do give them, we're going to separate it. Okay, we're going to take it and we're going to cut it into three pieces, okay, mainly at the beginning. And those three pieces, we call, we know them, and you've maybe heard this, this is the three branches of government. Okay, this is the three branches of government. Okay. So you see, they took that big rock of power, okay, and they broke it into three pieces. Why? Because now, okay, and they separated them, okay? And they said, this piece of power is never going to be connected with this piece of power. And this piece of power is never going to be conjoined with this piece of power. Because now if they try to drop this rock on your head, remember, they were going to try it together to drop the whole rock on your head. Now they can only, they have a smaller rock, don't they? Okay, each of these people have a smaller rock to drop on your head. Now it's going to hurt less. That's why they separated the power, okay? That's why they made an executive branch, a, a legislative branch, an executive branch, and a judicial branch. 
because in most governments, if we think about just a monarchy, for example, uh, those powers aren't separated, okay? The king is the, the executor. He's the executive of the law. Uh, the king is the judge, ultimately, uh, or, he, or he picks the judges, okay? And, or, and he is the lawmaker, okay? He gives the, the law by decree. And so they said even our executive, which is way weaker than a king anyway, even if it was one person up here, because he's only got a limited power, okay? Even this limited power, is we're going to separate, okay? We're going to separate it out. And not only, we didn't stop there with just the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. We actually separated the, the legislative branch. So we'll, we'll, we'll write legislative, uh, you know, executive, and judicial. We separated the legislative branch into two actually different pieces called the Senate and the House of Representatives, okay? So again, look at what the Senate has. You might think, wow, the senator, that's a big deal. Look at, the, look at the measly little piece of power that the Senate actually ended up with. If they tried to drop that rock on your head, it's certainly not going to hurt as much as the full power of the federal government, okay? It's certainly not going to hurt as much as the full power that you had originally. It's certainly not going to hurt as much as even this original state power, they have been given a, a very, very residual amount of power down here. It's really dwindled down over the course of, of the creation of the government into a Senate. And remember, there's like 100 people in the Senate. In the House of Representatives, there's like 400 people, okay? And so really these things are, are all, if we're talking about single people, these things are all broken up into really tiny little pieces, okay? And then the executive branch, of course, we have the president, probably the most powerful single individual in the government. I think that's uh, very fair to say. But also, it's the vice president, and it's the cabinet staff, okay? And these people, uh, we'll talk about checks and balances in a second, but it divvies up, okay? Even the executive branch is kind of uh, divvied up a little bit into multiple people with power. Of course, the Supreme Court, there's nine judges on the Supreme Court, so it's not just one person with this big rock of power right here. It's actually, uh, that rock is in nine different pieces, and that's just the Supreme Court, okay? That's just the Supreme Court. There's also federal courts at lower levels. Uh, and so, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's just the Supreme Court. So what we see is, man, this power is like disintegrating. I want to convey the idea of a big rock that's kind of disintegrating into smaller and smaller pieces. That's what the separation of powers is. It's so those rocks hurt less when they get thrown at you. That's the point. And what happens at the state level too? Remember, okay, the state level, we don't really have room to even illustrate this, but guess what? Every state government has three branches of government too, okay? So every little state government I shouldn't say little because it's supposed to be more powerful than the federal government, really, in a lot of ways. But uh, they have three branches, okay? And their three branches are divided into little pieces, too, into two, two houses of Congress and a state Supreme Court and state executives, okay? And so the power is separated, and they didn't have to do that. Okay, they made a conscious decision to separate the powers rather than keep the powers concentrated together. And the last one is really just a, kind of a, a, a minor point, but it shows the thinking of the founders, which is that this wasn't even good enough for the founders. Okay, they said they were still worried about too, about too much power because they were worried that even though we're disintegrating the, the rocks of power, and even though we didn't give up most of our rock anyway, we're still going to get these things thrown at us, and what we think is going to happen is that over time, like magnets, these uh, pieces of power are going to try to congeal and conjoin back together in the center, okay? Whether it's at the state level or at the federal level, the, these people are going to end up working together. They're going to collect all their power together. They're going to try to drop the big rock on our head, okay? That's what they thought was going to happen. So they set up a, a thing called checks and balances, where they set up rules in place that they were designed to try to keep them separate because they knew that over time there would be efforts or just not even necessarily conscious efforts, but human nature would try to work to bring these together. And I've got to say, we could talk all day about what the founders viewed about human nature. 
But what all this comes from, you might say, boy, were the founders like paranoid? What did they really think was going to happen? Well, yes, they were. I mean, by, by, we would say that today. I think that's a fair thing to say. They had a very negative view of human nature, that human nature was corrupt anyway. Okay, this is the influence of uh, the biblical worldview on the founders. They believed that human nature was corrupt anyway, and that it didn't get better once you got in positions of power. It got worse. Power corrupts absolute. Power corrupts absolutely. Somebody asked John Adams, uh, why do we separate powers in our government? And he wrote back and he said, he quoted the Bible. He said, it's because our heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so for that reason, yes, they were worried about the power accumulating in certain places. And so what they did is, even though they separated it, some people said it's fine. Some of the founders said it's fine. It's separated already. But some of the founders said not good enough. We've got to have checks and balances, which is ways of keeping the power separate. Okay? They were worried that it would come back together over time, even though they separated it in the first place. And so they put up ways that the... That the branches of government could uh, actually check and balance each other, basically ways that they could fight each other, okay? Ways that they set up uh, ways for them to have control over each other. For example, just a quick example, the legislative branch uh, has the power to appoint uh, to, well, the, the, the legislative branch has the power to approve the appointments that the president makes for the members of his branch. So these people, okay, down here, uh, cannot get to where they're at without the approval of these people over here. Same logic goes for the uh, Supreme Court judges. They're appointed by the president, but they're approved by the legislative branch. Okay, uh, the, uh, the judicial uh, branch has the authority to declare laws unconstitutional that the legislative branch makes. That's a power that they have over them. The president has the power to veto laws that the legislature makes. Uh, the legislature has the power to impeach the president or a Supreme Court judge. So we get the idea that they're, what they did uh, in checks and balances is they said, we're going to have them fight each other and keep the power separate that way. Uh, they're not going to be incentivized to work together. They're going to be kind of working against each other. And you might say, well, that's today we kind of think that sounds, uh, you know, um, you know, sad, or why can't they all, can't we all just get along? Uh, but they would, the founders would be happy with the government uh, people being against each other in a lot of ways, uh, because if they were against each other, they wouldn't be against us. So we see that the founders uh, wanted to include checks and balances because they wanted the government to work against each other in order to prevent the government coagulating the power, concentrating the power, and using it against us as they felt was just the natural course that human nature would take them down. And so we see here the, a little bit of a glimpse into the machine that the founders designed in the Constitution. We saw that they made a limited government, and that limited power that was given to the government uh, was still underneath a popular sovereignty. It was still under the authority of the people through the Constitution and through Republicanism, through elections. Okay, we also saw that there was a power-sharing agreement made by the states and the federal government whereby certain uh, the state governments would have powers that the federal government did not have. We saw that it operates by the rule of law, meaning that the Constitution is the authority rather than the actual people pulling the levers of the government. We saw that the power that the government even did have uh, under the law, under the people, uh, was uh, separated by the founders on purpose. And uh, in a similar way, fashion to the power was separated between the states and the federal government. In a similar way to the power was separated at the very beginning when the people uh, did not even give all the power that they had anyway. And uh, so that separation of powers and then the checks and balances, which was meant to maintain the separation of powers. Okay, so we see here seven principles uh, in the Constitution. You will find these. Uh, uh, they'll pop up in so many places as you read through the Constitution. A good exercise to do is go through the Constitution and see where you find all these things in the Constitution. And you'll see that some things really have 
a couple principles involved in them. Uh, maybe you'll find statements in the Constitution that have all of them kind of embedded uh, in the same paragraph or the same sentence. And so I hope this is a helpful visual to help you wrap your mind around uh, the basic uh, idea that the founders were getting at when they came up with the Constitution.